We are recording. This so, is not about sequins, Heather. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Um, so welcome to our basics SQL for Koha users session. Uh, my name is Jason Robb. I am the Seek and Find coordinator, coordinator at the Southeast Kansas Library System. Uh, we have a consortium of 47 libraries uh, that have been on Koha. We started in 2008, so been doing it for a little while. Still learning lots of things. And I will disclaim that I am mostly self-taught on SQL, so if I can do it, you can do it, right? I'm Christopher Brannon. I'm the IT coordinator for the Coeur d'Alene Public Library, and I head up the um, support team for our consortium, the Cooperative Information Network. In Idaho and Washington, and uh, we joined in 2012, uh, and I am self-taught as well, so you got a couple self-taught people here trying to, to teach the rest of you, uh, but uh, I hope that uh, you'll get a lot out of this, and we'll try to answer questions as we go, um, or towards the end, I, I should say, but uh, um, I hope that we can share some new information for you, help you to learn something new or understand something better. And with that said, I'm gonna throw it back to you, Jason. Okay, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try and take questions at the end, but feel free to use the chat um, and type in questions and we can pick some up as we go too, uh, if anything's confusing. So to get started, what is SQL? SQL uh, stands for Structured Query Language. Um, and it's, it's a language used to let us talk to the data that's in Koha. Um, it uses relational databases, which means we, we have data in Koha and we can relate it to other things in Koha and present that on screen with a report and it looks nice. And um, the more you know, the prettier you can make it look. Um, so we did want to talk a little bit about the different flavors of SQL. There are many out there. Um, Koha typically uses MySQL. Uh, I know that we've been moving towards using MariaDB. I think Bywater's been moving a lot of uh, customers to that, uh, which is just a fork of MySQL. And I wanted to mention that in the basics because those are good terms to use when you're Googling. So like the different flavors of SQL can sometimes have different um, syntax, different keywords that you use. So if you're trying to pull something off and you need to Google something like how to do something, you can add uh, MySQL to your search to get something more in there. Um, get to get some better results or more direct results. And another important thing to note as a beginner is that queries from the Koha staff client are read only. You're not gonna do any damage. You're just looking at stuff. You're pulling data to see. Um, there's no way to update your records from the staff client. You have to have wizards on the back end for that. So there are lots of resources out there on SQL um, and several for Koha specifically. Um, you can see, you can go to the reports library, which is linked when you're writing reports just on the sidebar. And so is the schema. And we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Um, I will say that it's fun to learn SQL um, and figure things out. I take it as kind of like a puzzle and a challenge, um, but somebody's probably already written a report that, and all you have to do is copy and paste from the wiki library. Or if you have MANA set up, then you can just import it directly into Koha. Um, I don't have MANA set up, so I can't show you what that looks like, but it's, it's pretty snazzy uh, from what I hear. So if you're, if you're trying to write a report, it's always also good to go to the library um, to see not only if there's a report there that you can use, but one that maybe you can modify and adjust to, for your use. Um, so I said the word schema. Uh, schema. The schema are basically just a list of all the tables um, in Koha, and that's kind of your roadmap when you're writing a report. Um, you can access the schema, as I said, from the sidebar when, when you're in the report section of Koha. Um, and the schema are broken down into tables and then fields. 
so when you first get there, you'll, you'll see your list of tables. You can search through it. There's a search bar on the top right um, to kind of narrow your results. And then you'll pick the table you think you need, click into it, and then you can see a list of the different fields in the tables. Um, and so you kind of want to just think of this like a spreadsheet. So your table is a big spreadsheet. The fields are your column headings, and then um, the rows within the table are your data. So your, your barcodes are in one column. Um, your biblio numbers are in a column, that kind of thing. Um, I put this screenshot here to kind of illustrate keys. And again, we talked about relational databases. So the different tables are related to each other and the keys are what ties them together. So you can see on this screenshot where um, biblio number ties items to the biblios table. Um, and we'll get into how you join those things together with keywords in a little bit. Um, so the, the screenshot I took is from the schema. Usually when you click into a table, it'll give you like a table full of um, the different fields. But if you scroll down, then you can actually see the visual uh, connections between the different tables. You can see that off to the right of items, it connects to like a whole gob of things. So um, it's good to kind of use that as your roadmap as you're trying to connect things together. Um, and then I just listed out a few of the most used tables. Uh, when you start out, these are the ones you're probably going to be looking at the most. So for patron information, you're getting it from borrowers. Um, for fines information, you're getting it from account lines. For circulation information, you get it from statistics. Item data comes from items. Uh, bibliographic data comes from biblio. Holds from reserves and transfers it comes from branch transfers if you're like me in a consortium uh, and you need to qu query transfers between libraries, that's where you'd go. Uh, I will also note that there are um, deleted tables as well. So like deleted items, deleted biblios. So if you need to query data on items that have been de deleted, you can link those back in as well. Um, there was a question about where to find the schema and I see a link was put in there and we'll also show you how to get there easily from the report screen a little later on. Um, and I also noted here tables to avoid, at least at first, are action logs, because um, they're huge and scary and nasty, and it's hard to connect things correctly. Um, and usually, anything you can get from action logs is a little more in-depth. So for us basic Koha SQLers, we're going to avoid that one for now. Um, circulation stats from statistics can also be really slow in a big system, so that's something else to be aware of. I've, I don't think I've ever crashed our Kohav running a SQL report, but um, I have gotten in the habit of running, testing things on a test server rather than production because it's kind of scary sometimes. I've crashed ours. I think that we might have some sort of proxy in place now that like times them out. I don't know how that works. Maybe Bywater people can chime in. Um, all right, so basic keywords. Uh, so keywords are what you use to kind of talk to the data. So for, <laughs> for picking fields, you're going to select, you're going to select a field from a table. So from is when you're picking the table. Um, joining lets you add more than one table together. And then of course, you can select from multiple tables at once. Um, you'll use where and and to filter your data. So um, if you want to narrow it down to a certain branch or a certain item type, that kind of thing. Uh, and then order by is used for sorting data. So those are just kind of the basic ones. There's a lot more keywords. We'll go into a few more later on. Um, but to get started, these are what you need to write a basic report. Um, so now you're kind of, you've kind of got all the building blocks. You've got the, the keywords to pick your fields. You know about tables. You know about fields. So now you're kind of ready to start putting your Legos together. So I'll toss it over to Christopher now to talk about that. Oh, wait, no, I lied. I have one more slide. Getting started. What to think about when you're writing a report. So I put this picture of a maze up because mazes are fun and they're puzzles. And I think that writing a report is kind of like a puzzle. So, and the best way to beat a puzzle is, or to solve a maze is to start at the end, I feel like. So you wanna kind of um, think
think about what your end result is first when you're, you're coming up with a report and think about how you want it to look before you ever get started. Um, and then once you have that in mind, you want to start thinking about um, looking at the different tables, seeing where you can get that data um, pulled from most efficiently. So if you want a barcode, you're definitely going to have to use items. If you want a title, you'll probably want to use Biblio, but you could also pull it from the marked data if you needed to. Um, if you need a subtitle, then you're going to have to pull that from the marked data. So just kind of thinking about which tables are necessary and which ones you can pass over. Um, starting out broad and narrowing. Uh, one, and I like to like, this is probably maybe just my process, but I like to start big and then narrow down. So like I'll do a select all from the table and then I'll add my where statements a little at a time, uh, filtered down to my, which fields I want. So like kind of hone in exactly on what I want. And then the, the fourth step I usually do is adding more usability. So I like to add links to reports. Um, I like to add limits to reports because that should, makes everything show on one screen sometimes. That's helpful. Um, you can add the order by statement after you've got your data kind of looking how you want it. Uh, so there's lots of thing, little things you can do after you've gotten the base data showing to make it um, easier to read and use um, the data that's actually showing on the screen. And then I put test and retest. Um, I have, <laughs> I have many, many times get sent a report to my boss and then he emails me back and says, why are these numbers so high? And then I realize that I've done something horribly wrong and it's duplicating one, one line. And so like, it's always good to have other people check your data too. Um, but just keep in mind that just because you wrote the report and it works, it doesn't mean that it's actually pulling exactly what you want. So testing and retesting is helpful. It's good to know that someone else does that too. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna to toss it over to Christopher. Okay, and just to answer, uh, to reiterate Heather's question, she asked if case matters. Uh, the case is really for readability. Um, you'll notice that um, even when you go through the uh, SQL library, you know, things are done differently from person to person uh, that has added. Uh, you can have everything on one line uh, and all in lowercase or all in uppercase. Um, doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It's just about readability and making it uh, easier for people to understand. So it's, it's more of a, uh, a user-friendly uh, being able to scan through it uh, thing. So, you know, you use the, we try to we try to stay consistent. I try to stay consistent when I'm writing reports so that people can easily read it line by line and, and figure out what's where. Um, but sometimes, you know, some of the more complicated reports are harder to, to dig through. All right, um, building a basic query. So to build a query, a query is basically, you know, you're just questioning a, uh, a table or database uh, for, for information and a basic query requires at least two pieces, uh, a select and from. Um, the where helps us to fine tune uh, that information, but select and from is basically all you need. Um, Jason, do you have uh, the ability to show an example of a, a, a table dump of just, you know, grab some information with just a, a select and from? I'm letting Jason do all the, the heavy lifting because uh, it keeps us from having us uh, switch screens too much. Plus, he's, he's more prepared than I am. Oh, you're muted. Is everybody seeing Koha now? Yep. Okay. So um, this is my test server where dreams go to die. It's graveyard bone stuff. Um, so just to get started and to point out some of these things that we talked about, when you always want to go to reports. When you're going to write your own report, you're going to do um, use saved or create from SQL. I always go to use saved. It's just a habit. Um, mostly because I want to check and see if I have a report before I uh, go in and start writing a new one. So I'll search um, the reports library and the schema are linked over here on the left. So I can click right there. If I'm thinking about a report, scroll down through, 
Um, I will note that this has been broken up a little bit and that threw me off a few few times. Uh, when I was looking for a holds report, I would do like a control F on this page and not find it and then realize, oh wait, I need to go over to the holds section for that. Um, and then the schema, as we talked about, is here. It's broken down by version. Most of us are on 1905 right now. So you just pick whichever version you're on. Um, and then you, you have your search over there. So if I want to get to the item schema, I can hit that. Yeah, that and then, search bar is really handy. Yep. And then it lists all my fields. And if I scroll all the way down, you can see those relational tables that I was talking about earlier. So just to touch on those. Now, my test server has lots of questionable data. Uh, we'll see what we can pull. So if we just want to do a dump, you always have to give it a name. So let's do a borrower's dump. Sure. And you just type select. I can make this a little bigger. Yeah, we can go over the schema again, for sure. Um, <laughs> I have, I do click things fast, so please, please do slow me down. Um, so if I want to just get everything from a table, I'm going to do a star. That means select all. And then I'm going to do from, and I know my table is borrowers. So it's saved. Now I'm going to hit run. And that's giving me every column, every field from that um, borrower's table, and then all the data that's in it. So like I was saying earlier, I like to do this just to see what's available and then start um, pulling things out. So like if I'm writing a borrower's report, I probably don't need all this information, but I do want like surname, first name, address, uh, phone maybe. So I, I could eliminate some of these um, by going back in the edit. And now instead of doing my all, I can do surname, first name, card number, maybe that's all I need. And the question was asked if we need to put a semicolon on the end. And unlike uh, JavaScript, uh, uh, no, you do not need to put semicolons on the ends. So, that kind of that narrowed it down to just those fields I picked. Great, thank you. Um, we can also add where because uh, you know when you do a table dump, you get absolutely everything, and you know especially if you were going to do something like the the logs, which can be endless. Um, uh, where comes in handy because you can filter your information. Uh, so. Um, <clears throat> You can find a specific, uh, a specific item or borrower. So if you need to narrow it down to just a specific thing, rather than everything, you can you can find that specific item by item number or uh, if, uh, if by a barcode. If you've linked over to the uh, items barcode, um, you can use uh, selects. Selects are um, uh, pieces of uh, information uh, where you tap into like your tables, your, um, oh, I cannot think of words today. Uh, the, uh, what is the, um, that section, the, the uh, values, the. <laughs> Parameters, authorized that, values. Uh, yes. Um, so you can tap into those predefined uh, sections so that uh, you just get a drop down and you can select what you want. Uh, you can also combine your your filters, your wares, so you can separate them with ands and uh, use combinations. Uh, so maybe you're looking for uh, for items that are in a specific collection. So uh, you can narrow it down by uh, several pieces of criteria. Next slide. So we're going to start off by talking about those parameters. Um, and I was inspired on my screen here. I, Jason usually likes to include things that uh, have to do with sharks. I like to <laughs> throw in the, the alligators here. So, um, <clears throat> 
So parameters are, are formatted with the hungry alligators. So the, the, the less than, the, the two less thans and the two greater than symbols. Uh, so we put our parameters there. The parameters uh, uh, are uh, uh, basically our filters, you know, the things that we want to put in the uh, where clause so that we can uh, tell it uh, what to narrow it down by. You can also define a, a label for your parameters uh, using the alligators with a pipe. And I don't mean a, an alligator smoking a pipe. Uh, the pipe is that vertical line down the middle that separates your label with the, uh, the parameter. So for example, uh, on here, I, I put uh, choose library uh, as my label. So your label always goes first inside the hungry alligators. Um, so choose library is the label, and then I have the pipe, and then uh, branches is the parameter that, that we're using. And in this case, it's uh, the, uh, the value that we uh, are going to uh, access that is selectable, meaning it's, it's a, a predefined set of uh, parameters that we can select from rather than something that we have to type in. So you can have you can have parameters that you can you can type in, but you can also have parameters that are selectable, and, and you can use uh, several things for your selectable parameters, such as any authorized value. That was the word I was going for earlier, and it just left my brain. Authorized value list. Um, so anything from the authorized value list you can use as a parameter. Um, you can use your library branches uh, with the word branches. So in my example up above, uh, that, uh, the choose library, I used branches there. Uh, you can use shelf location, the LOC, uh, item types. You can use collection codes, lost, not uh, for loan, which is not underscore loan, uh, withdrawn status, damaged, your category code, uh, and a special one uh, is date, which uh, gives you a pop-up calendar. That was a, a great addition when they added that uh, because dates are tricky because you have to enter them a specific way. You always have to have the, uh, the year first and you have to have hyphens, not uh, slashes. So uh, having the pop-up calendar really reduced the amount of errors and uh, uh, zero results uh, when you're doing a uh, a query with with dates. All right, next slide. You can join tables. You can add other tables together uh, so that uh, you're not depending on just one table. I mean, sometimes you want to you want to do searches for uh, items, but if you look at the uh, the schema, you'll know that if you access the items table, it has no titles and it has no authors. Uh, and so sometimes it's important to be able to join in other tables to get the rest of that information. Uh, we borrowed this uh, table. I think Nick used this table uh, before. This is out on the internet. These are all the different kinds of SQL joins on the right. Um, I, there's just a basic join, but there's a left join. There's a right join. Um, there's full outer join. There's inner joins. Lots of different joins, but the one that I use the most is the left join. So that's uh, down below my list here. I uh, blew that that one up for you. Um, I use left join almost exclusively, but you can use other joins. But this one is the one that's going to uh, be useful the most. Um, and we talked about joining items with another table so that you can get the titles and authors. Uh, titles and authors are in the uh, the biblio. And so you would join the Biblio and items together. Normally when you do a search, you know, you primarily think of the bulk of your information. Where's the bulk of your information coming from? And so I, you know, I, I would do a, uh, a query uh, starting off with the items and then I would join the Biblios to that. Um, 
looking at this diagram, you'll see that your you've your A and your B, those are two different tables that you're joining together. And A is going to be your primary uh, table and B is what you're joining on. It's important to think about what's your your main source, your main table that, that you are searching from, and then what you are joining on with the left join. The left join is important because um, your primary table, A, is gonna have everything that, that you are searching, and B may or may not have linked items, meaning there may be information uh, that, that links to what's in A, there may not be. Um, so that's why we use that, that left join, because A, you're always gonna have the results, all the results from your A table, and you may or may not have stuff that is included from B. Uh, just whether or not any information is linked uh, in that B table. Uh, a good example is authorized values. You may have uh, you may have all your items come up in your query, but you may not necessarily have a withdrawn on everything or a lost uh, status on all those items. So if you're joining a lost, if you're joining a status to those items. You still want to see all your items. You may want to see all your items, and you want to see any statuses that are linked to those, but you might not have a, a status linked to every single item on there. So uh, a left join is very important for that. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. We so we're going to give some examples. Um, I, uh, just a oh, few questions real fast. Okay. Um, Cheryl asked why it says table AA. So, and you can see it here in the example as well, statistics S. That's um, an alias. So basically it's just a way to abbreviate the table so you don't have to type it out every time you use it. So you can see the S.DateTime instead of typing out statistics.datetime. Um, that's why they did that. And George, and we'll talk about that a little more. We have some more on that later. George wants to know what happens when you just type join. Uh, join, if I remember correctly, and I don't use, I hardly ever use a join. Join, if you just use join and not a left join, you will only get results if there is a match between the two tables. So um, if like, for example, if I was doing an item, if I was doing an item table and I was joining uh, statuses, I would only get results if they're, you know, like if I was joining uh, with a lost status. If I was only looking for items that had lost statuses, that would be perfect. Um, but I would not get results on every single item. I would only get the items that had uh, uh, an actual link to a lost status in that other table. Right, and as, as George noted, join is the same as inner join, basically. Just, and Nick confirmed that, so. All right, so we have an example here. Uh, we used a, a select statement, we're doing count, and we'll talk about counts later, but um, we're, we're basically counting uh, our uh, date times from the statistics table. So we're using the statistics table, and we did use an alias here, S, so we don't have to type the full word statistics when we're referring to that. And, you know, why, why do we, we put that in there? Why is there like an S date time? Because sometimes when we're using multiple tables, they have the same field name. And so it's important to clarify which, uh, which table we're pulling that field from. Uh, and Koha is pretty, pretty good about it. it. It will tell you, you know, if you don't use that alias or that, that table name in front of the field, um, it'll tell you, tell you that it's ambiguous. You don't, it doesn't know which table you're pulling it from. So we're, you were pulling a, a count from a date time. We're, we're uh, in the statistics table. We use a left join. We're joining uh, from the items table and we use the alias I. Um, and we're, when we do a, a join, we tell it how we're joining that, that table. So we're joining uh, statistics, we're uh, left joining items using the item number. 
Um, there's different ways to, to join uh, or to um, connect two tables. Uh, here we used using because I'm only using, we're only, we only have two tables uh, and uh, they both have the same field. Uh, so we can use the, the term using to connect the two tables. They both have the field item number. And so we're saying using item number. We always put what we're using in uh, the parentheses there. Now, there's another way to uh, connect the tables. We'll go to the next slide here. This is using on. <laughs> this, this is a join with, a left join with on instead of using. In this case, this, this is, this is uh, you know, this is a long way of doing it. We could use the term, the, the keyword on and say the S item number equals the I item number. Using is the better method to do it because the fields are the same and we're only using two tables. If I was using more tables or if I was using two tables that the uh, field was not the exact same spelling or the same word, then on is the way you want to go so you can link those two items together. You want to, you want to do this for multiple tables because you want to tell it what two tables are being linked uh, when you have multiple tables involved. Uh, let's see here. Using does not need to be a declared key, correct? Jason? Um, right, so you don't have to, to join things using keys. Usually you will use the keys to join things together. But as Nick says, if the column names match exactly, then you can still join the tables together, even if they're not an, a declared key. And like, if, even if it doesn't have the little key symbol in the, the schema, if the, the data matches, it, it can be joined. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide, organizing. Let's see here, let me make sure I'm not, Okay, so when you get results, usually it's in the order that, uh, I, I'm, I'm making this assumption, it's in the order of your primary table and uh, the order that it's entered in the table. Um, I don't know if there's any default ordering uh, that plays outside of the order that it's actually in the table, but ordering allows you to organize that information so that um, you know, for example, if you're doing things by date or by a certain sequence, you want to get that in an ascending or descending order so it's not just scattered all over the place and you're having to search the entire table for something. You might want to organize your uh, patrons by last name. Um, you can do multiple organizations uh, uh, with several columns or fields. Um, it doesn't have to be by just one thing. So. When, when you're doing org, uh, organizing, you need to figure out what it is you're going to organize, how you're going to organizing, if it's going to be ascending or descending, and if you're going to order by multiple columns. So we'll go to the next slide, and we will show, here's, you've got your select, your from, and your where. We've, we've got a select, we're selecting several different fields uh, from the borrowers table, which, uh, uh, we have a, a, sh a short name of B. We have narrowed it down. Uh, we're narrowing it down uh, in our where clause with the category code of staff. So we're looking for a category code that equals staff. And um, the order that we are putting this information in, uh, I'm, I'm going to organize this by the branch code. So by branches, ascending. So when you do order, it's order by is, is the uh, keyword that you're using there. Uh, I, I select the, the field that I want to use, which is uh, from the table B dot and the field branch code. And then 
a space and then I put ASC for ascending or I could put DESC for descending if I wanted to go in reverse order. Let's go to the next slide. So that was a single uh, order. If I'm going to do multiple, there, there are a, a few ways I could do this. This example, I am listing several uh, fields that I'm going to organize by, and I'm, I, organize, I put these down by priority. So it's going to organize first by branch code. I separate these with commas. Then it's going to, within those branch codes, it's going to organize by surname and then another comma. And then it's going to organize within the surname the first name. And at the end, you know, notice I didn't put a comma here, it's the space. I tell it how these are all going to be organized. I'm doing them all the same, so I only have to tell it this once, which is ascending. So every one of these is going to be organized ascending. Let's go to the next slide. Now here's an example where I might not want them all organized the same way. So I can, before I do the comma for the next field, I can list how I want to organize something differently. So the branch code, I want to organize descending, but the surname and the first name, I do want them organized ascending. So we have a question, do you still need to use the B surname when you're only pulling from a single table? Couldn't you just say surname? It would, put, yes, yes. We don't have to necessarily put the, um, the table reference uh, on these. I like to do it by default because you never know when you're going to copy this and modify it or um, uh, just you know, make this more complicated or add in more tables. And if you do, then you're gonna have to go back and, and uh, add those in. And that's where I get tripped up a lot because if you don't have that in there and you add more tables that do have them, then you can cause some problems. Makes sense, thank you, you're welcome. All right. Okay, so a few useful tactics. We've already talked about aliases a little bit. So um, as we said, it's, it's more, just to make it more readable and more scalable, really. Um, and you can name them anything you want. The, the common conventions are just using the first letter, but I like to use P for borrowers because I'm usually using B for Biblio, so P for borrowers, P for patrons, that kind of thing. So another important thing to realize um, is that you're going to copy a report from the um, the wiki or something, and it's going to have these kinds of things in it. So even if you don't want to use aliases, you still need to know that that's what it means. Um, another thing you can do with aliases is, which took me like years to like figure out, I didn't realize you could do this, um, is you can join the same table multiple times by referencing the table with different names. So authorized values, if I do AV1, AV2, AV3, then I can, I can, um, I can join AV1 on collection code, and then I can join AV2 on shelf location, and AV3 on item type. So, or not really item type, it's a different piece. But um, that way I can get a cleaner result, because when you just pull in an authorized value, it's gonna be the actual value that you put in and not the description. Um, so yeah, that's just a handy little trick. Um, we also talk about date filters here. Uh, so if you're doing a date, you can do a between statement. So between date pipe with the little date keyword and and pipe the date keyword. It'll look cleaner when you run the report than it does here because uh, it's kind of confusing because you're using keywords and keywords next to each other. But um, we can show what that actually looks like here in a bit. And then concatenation is the magical tool to make links um, and also put multiple fields into a single result field, I guess. Christopher, did you have anything else to say on that one? Uh, just to simplify your columns, uh, mostly, you know, so that you don't have a column for every single field. If you want, like, 
who, who wants a, a different column for every status? You know, you might want to be able to join those together in, in one column so that it's a little cleaner. So sometimes you want to join the names. You don't need to separate them by uh, surname and first name. So you might want to put them together. So. Yeah, yeah. So like, and uh, I think I've done this with subtitle, like title, subtitle before. So you can get like a full title. Um, you can concatenate. So concatenate just means kind of smash them together. Okay, is this... So, yeah, here's just an example of between, and it's a little clear the way that Christopher has this one written out, where the the text here, where it says between year, year, month, month, date, date, is what you're going to see when you run the report. And then the pipe date makes it use the pop-up calendar. Um, and then you'll get another uh, and then you and, so you're doing your date range there. So between this date and this date. Let's go and on I the think, next slide. Okay. So here's an example of uh, concat, and this was a good example because it actually uses both concat WS and concat. Uh, the concat WS, the first example on there, um, mashes things up, but it gives you the option of a, a separator. So in this case, the um, the surname and the first name are in this concat. So we, we say the keyword concat underscore WS and in parentheses, we put in are the parameters for that concatenation. So uh, the first thing in quotes is the comma and space. So there's a comma and space. That's what we're defining as our separator for the things that are being mashed up together here. And then after that, um, uh, a comma, then we start listing the things uh, separated by commas uh, that are going to be added together. So in this case, the field uh, surname and then the first name. So they're gonna be added together in that order and they're gonna be separated by the comma and the space. Um, <clears throat> The next one, uh, oh, excuse me, after, after that, so after we close the parenthesis there, we can list as, we can say as, and this is what the field is going to, the field header is going to show up as, it'll show up as patron. So the surname, comma, space, first name is going to show up under the column that says patron. So if we didn't do that, the whole concat uh, underscore WS and uh, the rest of that is going to show up as the the header name and that's pretty ugly so we want something a little bit more user-friendly plus we can we can refer back to the uh, the title that we give it uh, in uh, different parts of our report so that we don't have to keep referring back to this whole mess uh, so patron just makes it more user-friendly for the for the column for the end user and for you uh, concat is a little similar, uh, but you don't start off with a separator. You're basically just listing everything that you're going to mash together. So on the concat, on this one, we, we created a link. And so it starts off with our HTML uh, that refers to, and <laughs> I actually have my, my HTML in there. Uh, uh, refers to uh, the borrower, so we can link to the actual borrower in Koha from the report. So this has the, the starts off with the link, and then where we need the borrower number, we close off uh, with our uh, uh, quote, put in a comma, and then we plug in our field that we're going to use that that goes in that borrower number position in that that field or in that uh, in that link, then a comma. Then we do our quote again and continue on with our HTML. Then we close that off again. And then uh, we uh, do our quote again and I'm inserting a card number. This is actually what shows in the report, the, the linkable uh, result. So it's actually gonna just show the card number, but when you click on the card number, it'll use this link to go into Koha. Um, and again, I gave this after the, the parenthesis, I gave this uh, a, a short term library card. So it's just going to have the header library card at the top rather than this big long uh, 
mess of a HTML uh, description for the header. And I'll just jump in and say the trickiest part about making links like this is the formatting. And there are um, examples on the wiki that you can just copy over. So if this is intimidating to you, the way it's all kind of chunked together, <laughs> um, you can use the wiki to kind of guide you through uh, what you're doing there. And uh, you know, I, I form these uh, simply by, you know, I, I go to an actual uh, borrower and I copy the, the HTML in the, in the uh, URL address. And then, you know, I look for where the borrower number is plugged in. And then that's the piece that I replace in, the, in, in this uh, uh, select term. So, uh, you know, it, th this is one of the harder things to do, but you can build these links, uh, which is really handy. Yeah, and as Nick and George seconded there, if you take off everything from the H and HTTP to the N in COM, um, then your reports will be shareable and they'll still work on any system. You don't I have don't to share things. Yeah, Christopher <laughs> does, he's not a sharer. Um, so you will see reports like that in the wiki as well that you can just copy and it'll already have the link there for you and it will work. You don't have to have your domain name in there. And this, you know, and this is, you know, this is because I did copy it uh, from my URL. So yeah, you will have, you can remember <clears throat> if you remember to do that. Then yes, uh, share that out in the library. You don't want to share it with that domain uh, in the library. It might confuse some people. All right, Jason. Okay, next up, we're talking about grouping. So. Um, so far we've we've talked about how to pull data in basically a list so like if you pull a list of borrowers or a list of items that kind of thing uh, but some of the more common reports that people ask you to write are like how many checkouts did were there of adult books how many fiction checked out that kind of thing so for that you you have to aggregate your results and kind of smash them down um, so you're getting a category with a a, a number basically and you do that by using a group by statement. Um, like I said, you can use it for circulation, you can use it for item counts, there's lots of different uh, uses for grouping. Uh, your, your main keywords to start out are count. So if you do a count uh, of, a, of a field, then you're gonna get a count. Um, if you do a, you can also do a sum. Um, those are both aggregate keywords. So you're going to have to have a group by uh, statement to make those work. Um, and then we'll also talk a little bit about having, which is a way to uh, filter your results. So I have this example, circulation by collection codes. And I'm going to skip back over to my test server if I can find it. And I think I already copied that one in. So we can just look at some live reporting here. Um, so I did a group by here. So let's Okay, so here's my SQL for this one. So I've got um, select a.lib as collection. So to kind of digest that, I've joined authorized values as a and I wanted the collection code. I, that's what I wanted to group this report by. So I've joined statistics on the collection code and then I've joined in authorized values, which is what gets me that description rather than the, um, the actual authorized value. Um, so that, that will give me a clean result, a collection. And then I do a count star, which again means all, so I'm counting all the rows in statistics. Um, and then, uh, so, and I also just want to check out and renews. So that's a different column. So like in the statistics table, there's a type column and it has different standard values, issue, renew, um, there's a check-in. I'm not sure what the keywords for that are. But for most circulation reports, I use issue and renew because I want a total circulation. Um, 
And then I've got a date time filter like we talked about. Date time is a field in the statistics table that I can use to find things between uh, a date range. And then branch is also already in the statistics table. Um, and I did kind of make this messy just so that you can see that different, you can combine different strategies. So like statistics doesn't have an alias. So um, since branch is unique to statistics and date time and type are unique to statistics, I didn't need to use an alias there. I did use an alias for authorized value because I hate typing out the word authorized underscore values. Um, it's got an S in there, it's British. I can't ever remember that. I try to put the Z in. So I always abbreviate that one. Um, and then my group by statement. So I want to group the results by collection code so that I'm getting all the counts for collection code, um, all the counts for adult book, all the accounts for juvenile book, that kind of thing. Uh, so if I run this report, we'll see some of the things we've talked about in action. So this is the date range parameters that we saw. So you can see the text that we typed and then the pop-up calendar. And I'm just gonna pick something way in the past. And then the second, and then my branch filter is here, so. Now we get some results. So you can see that it's pulled the authorized value description. Uh, this is a little messy still because I, because of the way I joined authorized value without a qualifier. <laughs> so it, this isn't good results, but that's a good example of bad results. Um, and I know that because I know my authorized my collection codes are these things, juvenile books, adult books. I know that I don't have an illustrator collection code. Um, but you can see what a grouping does. So then we, we get the count there. Um, okay. So that's a bad report. If you're like me and your authorized values are a mess, you might not want to copy that one. Just saying. Or if you want to practice cleaning it up, go for it. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on with um, aggregated records is the difference between where and having. So where filters arose before you group them. So if you want to say just pick results from one library, you're doing a where statement. Having uh, excludes records after the grouping. So um, say you've you've grouped everything, you've counted everything, and then you only want to see results that are more than X, Y, Z. Like, um, I only want to see things that have checked out more than 20 times, something like that. Then I would group, I would count my, my checkouts, and then say, I have, uh, I have to see things that have checked out more than 20 times. So that's a having statement. Um, I've also used having to try and find possible duplicates, which gets really frustrating. <laughs> um, but you can use it in that way too, to do like a count of exact matches and then eliminate things that aren't an exact match. Um, so I have a super simple example for using having that I did recently. Uh, let's go here. My test server is in at my desk at work, so it's a little slow. So if I, sh I'll just show that one. So it's got a select and I want the branch code um, and then a sum. So in this report, I wanted to find out which of my libraries don't have fines. They're not charging fines. And this is a new table we haven't talked about either. So your circ fine rules are in the issuing rules table. So what I can do is take the total of the fine column in the issuing rules table. And if it's zeroed out, then I know that that library doesn't charge fines. Um, so I'm just selecting the branch code because I want a breakdown of all the branches that don't have fines. And then I'm totaling the fines and I'm using a sum uh, for that. And I've also given it this alias total fines. Um, from issuing rules and then I group by the branch code because that's how I want the breakdown to come and then I've done having total fines as zero so I can use this alias that I, I created up here uh, as my my filter down here 
if I were to put this in the where statement instead, if I were to do um, where some uh, sum of finds is equal to zero, it would give me an error. Um, so run that. And we can see here that I have four libraries in my test server that don't have any circ find rules that say um, that they charge fines. So next up is unions, which is Christopher. I don't know, we didn't really set a time limit on this, so we can't keep going, um, but we are coming up on an hour. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just touch real quick on uh, George's question about uh, date times uh, in between. Um, <clears throat> I can't address all of them right now, uh, but there are some issues with, with dates and times because there is a timestamp uh, involved in some date fields and, uh, or date time fields and some fields are just strictly dates. Um, <clears throat> there can be some complications between uh, comparing the couple um, and Nick does point out that you can strip out just the the date from a date time with uh, with this uh, um, function date. Um, you know and also when you're doing a between uh, with a date time, I often will pick the day after for the uh, for the the last uh, date in the the between because um, the timestamp is usually at the beginning of the day, and if you include uh, uh, you know from this date to this date and use the last date, it won't include the last date. Um, because it's looking at that timestamp as well, which is at the beginning of the day. Um, so you got you to play around with it and test and make sure you're getting all of your, your information with those betweens. It can be tricky. Uh, the, the dates uh, can trip you up at times. Um, all right, let's talk about unions real quick. Unions are, are kind of fun, but they can be kind of scary if you don't know what you're doing. Um, Sometimes you want to get information like, for example, if you're getting some uh, statistical information, sometimes I'll want to get information on items within a, a, a date range, or uh, I'll want to get uh, information on borrowers within a date range. And if you're like our library, um, you're constantly updating information or weeding out uh, items or people uh, that are no longer uh, active. and um, those statistics from last month, you know, if you're grabbing statistics from last month and you've already deleted some of those things, uh, maybe somebody uh, shortly uh, had an account and then they, they left and you deleted that account or you had an item and somebody stole it or, or it, it got lost and you had to delete it. But statistically, it still was relevant for that month. Um, I want to pull information from deleted items as well as items or from deleted borrowers as well as borrowers. So um, this is where unions can come in handy. Um, so if you go to the next slide, here's an example um, of just a basic table. This is without a union. So I'm pulling borrower information. I'm pulling the card number, the last name, first name, and uh, when they enrolled from the borrowers table. and I'm, uh, I'm telling it uh, I want to see the date enrolled uh, after a certain date. Next slide. So if I want to do borrowers and deleted borrowers, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I'm going to basically build the same uh, uh, SQL statement twice, but one is pu uh, pulling from borrowers and the other one is pulling from deleted borrowers. So the top one is the, the borrowers table. And then between these, I'm using the keyword union. So I'm joining these two uh, results together with a union. And it's basically like running two reports together at the same time. Uh, so my bottom table is pulling from the deleted borrowers. Now, the, the key thing to remember if you're doing a union is you wanna have all the same fields. If you don't have all the same fields, you're gonna get some errors. So I have to make sure that both tables are doing the card number, the surname, the first name, and date enrolled, which is really easy with these two tables because they're structured exactly the same. 
Um, so I just copied one uh, query uh, and then I put the word union and then I pasted that, that same query and then I just changed out the table that I referenced with deleted borrowers. This made it really easy because I didn't have any um, aliases or uh, table references in front of the fields. Uh, but if you do, if it's a more complicated structure, make sure that you go through and change all those uh, uh, table references or aliases in your copied uh, SQL. Uh, next slide. Querying mark data. Um, mark data is a little challenging because uh, <laughs> if you've ever delved into the mark tables, it's a, it is it is a really interesting beast. There is in the SQL library, there is a section towards the, the beginning that talks about how to extract this data. And we, I did just a really uh, brief rundown on how to get this information. But um, this is a very basic structure in the select statement, how to pull this information. Your table is the Biblio metadata. So that's what the table that we're pulling from. And my where I'm, I'm specifically pulling it from a, a, a specific Biblio number. But the select statement's a little tricky. Uh, so I'm using uh, this function called extract value. And the structure is basically the same, except for what I have here in, that's highlighted um, in the metadata, metadata uh, in the quote after the, the two forward slashes. I'm specifying that my, my data field is going to be this tag 952. So the, the, what's in the quotes there in 952, that is the, uh, the mark uh, uh, field that I'm, I'm going for. And then after the slash is your subfield. And I'm not a cataloger, so excuse me if I, if I get some terms wrong here. Uh, this is my, my understanding of it. And you know I pull a lot from the, the SQL library when I'm trying to figure these things out. But um, so I'm pulling from the 952 and I'm using an, uh, an asterisk here uh, as the subfield to say I want all subfields. So 952, all subfields. And then of course I say I want this to show as item so it doesn't have all this extract value information uh, as the header for this, this column in the results. Let's go to the next slide. If I wanted a specific subfield, this is how it would look. I'm, I'm pulling from the data field, the 260, and the subfield in this case is going to be uh, the B subfield. So this is how we structure this. Uh, notice that the, uh, it, uh, the, the field is at tag and the subfield is at code in this particular case. As I said, there's a lot more to this than what we're showing here, um, but this is just a quick and dirty rundown of how this works. And if you go to the next slide, sometimes you'll have a, uh, a, uh, a field that there are multiple instances of. In this case, you're gonna have to use what we call a, an array in order to pull the particular one that you want. And there are ways to grab all of, all of them. Uh, I would suggest looking at the SQL uh, library for more specifics on this. But if I wanted to like pull, I can't remember, is this, Jason, do you remember if this is zero based array or if this is the one based array? I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I can't remember if the first one is always zero or if the first one is always one. Uh, some arrays are, are different than others. But in this case, I'm pulling a, a specific one here. And so this highlighted section here, this is a little added snippet. I have multiple 856s, so I'm telling it to pull uh, the first one, I think. I think that's what one is, but it could be the second one, in, depending on how the array is built. Um, uh, Nick says that he uh, believes that they begin at one. So this would be the first one. So I'm pulling the first 856. If I wanted the second instance of 856, then I would put a two in there. Um, so that's pretty, you know, straightforward and self-explanatory in that. Uh, 
putting the instance that you want in that that uh, those braces uh, after the field. So sorry that was a little bit rushed. This is this is about the extent of my knowledge on this. Uh, Jason, do you have anything to add? I just want to say that like querying mark data is a little more on the advanced side. Pretty much everything you're doing when you're first starting out, all that stuff's going to be in a table somewhere. So you don't need to query the 245A for the title. You can just pull that from the Biblio table. Um, your publisher information is probably mapped into Biblio items. So you can pull that from there rather than going into the mark data. It's, it's just when you need like the special fields. Like you can't get a subfield from the Biblio table. You do have to get those subfields from the, the metadata. Um, so it's don't be intimidated or scared off by this, I would say. And there was a question Heather asked, uh, if you leave out the one here, does it pull all the fields? And Nick confirmed that it does, and it con concatenates each field with the pipe. So um, that, is, that is the end of what we have to show for basics. Um, I did want to throw this in at the end. This is something that I discovered while we were uh, putting this together. There is a site called sqfiddle.com. Uh, this particular link uh, goes to a specific instance of it. Um, if you go up to the top, uh, it's, it's pointing specifically at the SQLite um, uh, type of SQL. There are different versions of this, and this one was pretty straightforward in uh, matching kind of you know the structure, but uh, you know, I've, I've only played with it a little bit and, and this is a good place if you want to play with some SQL and not run the risk of bogging down your server or making a mistake. You can always test things here. The one tricky part is when you're building a schema uh, or uh, building your, your data to work with because this has no data to work with uh, initially. Uh, there is some sample stuff. If you go into the next column there, um, you can It'll build some basic tables, and then from there you can you could you could expand on that. But this gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, but if if you just want to use some uh, basic data, basically you're creating some data over on the left table, uh, and you'd have to learn how to do this. It's it's not necessarily easy right off the bat. But this is this is a good little um, test environment to to play with if you if you want to figure out how to build or structure some SQL. So over on the right hand side is a place where you actually build your, your query. Uh, so you can see some stuff that you actually uh, recognize from, from SQL over there. Uh, and then you can run it and get your results. So down below is the results of that, that SQL. So you can go in there, you can change, you can add tables, you can you know, build more tables. And it's, you know, if you look at it, you can probably figure out how they built the table uh, and build more tables and then uh, utilize that in your query over on the right hand side. But uh, this was just a, a, a great little tool if you wanted to try and do something outside of the work environment. And over in the chat we've got um, Heather asked if, if we can play with reports in the Bywater demo um, and Nick noted that it does reset every several hours so you may lose your work but you can use the sandboxes as well. Um, there's data in there you can play with uh, and you can spin that up just for yourself. So there are other options out there as well. And Nick put a link into the sandboxes if anybody wants to go Which try and extremely helpful. crash a sandbox with your SQL. Go for it. <laughs> so that is about it for, for us. Um, um, I know that we've gone over just a little bit on our time, uh, but uh, are there any uh, last questions before we, we uh, finish up here and close up? I will say this is just kind of the, the tip of the iceberg. There's plenty more you can do with SQL and Koha, um, but we just wanted to kind of lay some groundwork here. So hopefully it helped.
And somebody said that they took some courses and felt feel like they learned a, a lot more from both of us. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I stress out with things like this because I am not not necessarily the the uh, um, authoritative person on on SQL, but I have learned a lot and taught myself a lot over the years, and I still get some things wrong. Uh, but you know, it, you learn from your mistakes sometimes. Oh yeah, my strategy is always trial and error. So <laughs> it'll tell you if it didn't work. Um, Elaine's asking if there's any websites recommended for basic syntax. Um, I don't have anything off the top of my head. I usually just, yeah, W3, Carolyn said, I, I use that sometimes. I usually just Google around until I find what I need. Um, I When I Google for something, you know, I'll, I'll lead it off with a, a my, I'll do a MySQL. If you just do SQL, uh, it's hit and miss because you know there are different flavors of SQL and you know, a lot of times you will get uh, SQL Server kind of stuff uh, which doesn't necessarily work. MySQL I get uh, better results with um, but yeah I, I just Google what I don't know. Yeah and usually in your results you'll see a Stack Overflow link and those are the best because you can pretty much like bang your head against that until you make it work. <laughs> Uh, it'll give you enough information to work off of. Yeah. And Carolyn shared the W3 uh, link that she had. And I'll make sure and get the chat posted somewhere and link that with the video as well. So these links are preserved. Well, I want to thank everybody that, that joined us today. Um, wow, this was a huge turnout, even towards the, the very end, uh, uh, for all of you to hang out with us and uh, learn what we have to say about SQL. You know, I, I can't say it's any better or worse than any of the other presentations that we've had on SQL, but um, uh, I enjoyed working with you, Jason, on this. And, and I, I feel like this was, this was a, a, a decent presentation, you know. Aside from me being absent-minded about words, but uh, uh, finally remember the word authorized values, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. Thanks everyone for coming. Yes, thank you. And have a good week. <laughs>